pick up on this, but uh, Greg O'Brien wrote an article uh, that's up there called the European uh, on the European uh, Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, and this has to do with the death penalty, of course. Uh, would either one of you want to tell us about that? Yeah, this is this is really it's unbelievable. Actually, uh, we never because in the opening of that article it says everyone has everyone's right to life shall be protected by law, and then it says the death penalty the death penalty shall be abolished. But then when you look further, it says um, the deprivation of life uh, shall not be regarded as inflicted in contravention of this article when it results from use of force. Uh, and then it goes on to talking about quelling a riot, insurrection, lawful arrest, um, time of war, or imminent threat of war. So the, it, it's, it's pretty, it's explicitly clear here that uh, the death penalty will not be abolished, and <laughs> there's actually huge more areas where they can int- introduce the death penalty. And it, this is extremely worrying because, and when you think of the imminent threat of war, I mean we've got the the war on terror and right, right. you know it, it, it's a very vague and very vague and very very worrying uh, trend here hmm. and I think um, we should be all very uh, anxious about this charter of fundamental rights indeed indeed and you know one thing that is kind of is curious here as you say because this many of the the, the things uh, that are going in within uh, the guise of the EU constitution here um, is directly in violation, as you guys have pointed out here, to to the constitutions of different countries. Uh, the the question is, do you think that this is being being done in some way still on a legal level, meaning that this is something that they can just apply above a country, meaning that uh, uh, in regards to legal terms, this is uh, termed a state and not a country, therefore this can uh, overrule. Uh, a country's own laws or even constitution, or do you guys think that this is actually being put in uh, unlawfully? Have you been able to figure that out? Well, th- definitely the, the referendum is it's not going to be a fair referendum because w- what the, the RTE, the national television station here, they're having debates and they're having two from the yes side and one from the no side, and they're spending millions of the government of the people's money, the government is spending it, uh, giving the so-called facts, but they just they give the facts of the the Charter of Human Rights. They say everybody has to, they will publish. Everybody has the right to life. Everybody has the right to freedom of expression. They don't publish any of the negatives. So in a way, legally, they are given the facts, but there there is some people here in Ireland now who are looking into bringing a case that the referendum is going to be biased. Really, and if you look, if you try and find out why why does the EU want to take control of our rights? Why do they want to allow? To, why why are they putting in legal explanations that goes against the rights they're supposedly given us? Why yeah. are they allowing the, the death penalty to come in in an imminent threat of war? And then who are the people? If you look at the people who are passing these laws, the EU. Parliament recently voted, they had a report expose, exposing uh, criminality of their expenditures and they had a vote whether to publish it out into the public or not and the members of Parliament voted not <laughs> not to publish it. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the people that you're putting all your trust in, your human rights in, you're putting into these people and they also had a vote to respect the Irish referendum, whether they would respect it or not. And the vast majority of the MEPs voted that they will not respect it. Um, that, that was, that's not legally binding. So if Ireland vote, no, it will stop the Lisbon Treaty. But it just shows you the, the mindset of the people who are going to be in control yeah. of every aspect of your life. And two of the top foreign uh, policy makers of the EU wrote a report where they want to take more control, more rights on the claim of climate change. Hmm. And they've, the EU has stopped using the word man-made global warming. That, that's not in the treaty. They use the word climate change. Hmm. Now, when has the climate ever stopped change? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and um, they're, they're talking about, in this report, they're talking about that there's going to be wars for resources because of climate change and that they need to 
in a couple of years build up an EU army. Yeah, right, right. And um, some of the areas that the Lisbon Treaty takes over a vast amount of areas of power, but in the future they could switch, they could all have a vote, and if they all vote yes, they could switch new powers over to the EU without having further referendums. So they could switch it over where they could create a full military. And in the Lisbon Treaty, it does talk about expansion of military. Mm -hmm. Every country has to expand their military and be prepared for war. And in the defense of another EU member, they all have to come together. And um, Hmm. before, right now, the way it stands, if uh, Ireland is to go to war with the EU, the people have to have a referendum. After the Lisbon Treaty, the people will not have a referendum. Our parliament... Our politicians who all want this Lisbon Treaty can vote yes to to going to war. So it's going to be taken out of the hands of the people. Hmm. That, that's the mindset of these these guys. Oh my the God. So, so, it's um, important hmm. to recognise as well that um, in Sweden, like you have had a referendum in 2003 on the uh, joining the euro. The currency, yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, I believe uh, all the, all the politicians in in Sweden were. We're far joining the euro, but you know you didn't you didn't vote the way you were supposed to vote, so <laughs> not to give you a referendum again. Well, I mean that's the that's the you know one of the worrying areas here that they they'll keep pushing and pushing and pushing until they get their way, and and even though if they can't do it in big steps like they want to do it. Uh, they'll use the tippy toe tactic and and you know change a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, and I guess the only way to actually be kind of vigilant against this and being aware against this is to constantly try to keep up in the uh, you know it's it's a it's both a legal battle in a way, but it's also kind of a uh, a propaganda battle and a word battle. You got to you know keep an eye on everything, every single move that they do. Do, do you guys feel that this is this is the way the the within quotes here the war is is kind of uh, going at this point. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's definitely. You know, I think, um, like you said, there the tiptoe approach, and I think that is the the main approach of the EU, is that it's a slow, gradual erosion of uh, democracy and sovereignty, and they, they plan you know they plan decades in advance. Like we have a quote here, and it goes back to May 1950. And it's from um, it's the Schumann Declaration. And it says, The pooling of coal and steel production should immediately be provided for the setting up of common foundations for economic development as a first step in the Federation of Europe. And that's from May 1950. So this is, this is how long these, these people are prepared to wait. And, it, you know, it, I think a, a lot of people, when you mention the EU, like they just go to sleep because... They don't understand it. It's a, the whole thing is a huge, yeah. a huge structure. And there's, you know, there's so many different aspects to it, and it, it, you know, a lot of people don't understand how the EU works. People, even people that are have been in the EU for you know MEPs in the EU for 30 years, they still don't fully understand how how the whole thing works. So I think this is part of their approach as well, is to try and kind of bore people that it's so big that you know it's so complex uh, that it's just like a haze and, and that kind of switches people off as well uh, and, and that's another problem as well you know you're trying to talk to people about the EU and uh, it's just such a big thing and uh, it's so it's so hard to to actually even find the the, the language to describe it you know well that's right and and I think you're you raise a key point there uh, the first is is the, I guess the key, uh, the war of attrition as it's called the the, the slow, gradual process of of uh, you know fighting a war basically against a, a population, and in this case it's the, the the people of Europe and the the important area there also is that um, many of the MEPs within the EU actually are having difficulty understanding the. the uh, the laws that are going in, they don't have obviously n- not enough time to read and go through much of the s- stuff that they sign off on. Uh, there's so many things like this, and many many MEPs down there actually seems to be very uh, insecure. And when they were, you know, are addressed like here in Sweden, for instance, it doesn't even seem like many of the people can really talk about all the stuff that's going on because they have no they have no clue basically. 
Yeah, even yes, even some of the MEPs have no clue. Like most of the law signed in the EU is is done by the working groups. It's it's only the the ones that they view important that get, that get signed by the ministers. Most there's there's um, three t- three thousand three hundred working groups behind the EU who really pull it all together and make things happen. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, these are these are secret working groups, so nobody nobody knows even who's on these groups or how, how they're formed or how how the uh, legislation, the whole process of the legislation. So this is the really the hidden hand in the EU is the, the these secret working groups. Hmm. And, you know that's they're pulling they're really running Europe uh, and and we don't know who these people are people are. So it's. Uh, so it has a, on the outside it looks kind of democratic, but actually when you look into it, it is it, the whole thing is a complete con. It, it's it's a scam, and um, y- y- you know it, it's just it's it's so complex that you can't actually see it. It's really smoke and mirrors, you know. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. And and you know we still have national parliaments to distract you from the real power, but like uh, in Ireland. Um, I think it's something like 85% of our laws now are just come from Europe, and our national parliament just rubber stamps them. Hmm. So when we're voting for when we're voting for our local MPs, we're we're voting for people that are responsible for 15% of the legislation. So uh, this is the whole illusion of democracy, hmm. the whole smoke and mirrors behind the EU. Incredible. And one thing that comes to mind, and I don't know if you guys like to speculate or not, but uh, I want to throw this out anyway, and if either one of you want to pick up on it, that's fine. Uh, It seems like they are kind of setting up this superpower. I mean, this is the United States of of Europe, basically, and and especially in regards to what you read um, when it comes to the different military alliances, that NATO is supposed to be, you know, more closely integrated. within the European Union eventually. Uh, it seems to be like they're almost setting up and uh, planning for some kind of, you know, next world war. And what they w- want to have in that war is is uh, an European army. Uh, any speculations on, on that at all, guys? Um, well, that's... Um, well, the EU... Well, when, when the, if this Lisbon Treaty goes ahead, the EU will be a, a federal state with all aspects of a federal state. Now, um, with regards to the army, um, they, it won't, they won't have a full army yet. Um, so, but there, as you know, like there is a lot of uh, different alliances going on at the moment. Um, but some countries will still have a veto with regard to some of the military uh, activities. But it's not going to stop, uh, stop like enhanced cooperation, where a number of the bigger countries get together and decide to, to form uh, alliances. And um, it's really a gradual step there in, in the whole military objective of the EU. And we see it now in Chad and in other countries where they're trying to start, um, you know, bringing in an EU army. Um, and it's, it's really, I suppose, the first step towards that. And um, like you said as well, you know, in the 21st century now, we're going to have the resource wars. Well, they started already. So this is going to be a big, huge aspect of the 21st century is the, the resource wars uh, and the EU, I think, is is aiming towards that. Hmm, interesting. Anthony, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, the elite, they, they need a, a new superpower to take over from the United States. As you know, the dollar is, is collapsing. And when the inflation really hits in the U.S., like they, they can't afford, the U.S. is bankrupt. They're printing trillions and trillions every year to fund their the war and that's uh, going to inflate at the moment China is pegged to the dollars and uh, the US are getting lots of food from from China so in the US they haven't really felt it yet but uh, this is, if China comes off that peg it, it's uh, depression in America and I think the, the globalists they need a new power to, to take over and but they also have China they propped up China by sending the manufacturing jobs over to China and they're investing in China and the Chinese actually